Well, according to my clock, it is time for us to get started. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, depending on where you are in which part of the world you are. And welcome to this third session of the PCST Conference on Visual Presentations. My name is Marina Yubar, and I will be chairing this session today. I'm a science communication researcher at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Our theme today is COVID environment and more. It's going to be a fast paced session where each of the presenters will have only three minutes to introduce their topics. The good news is that for up to a month after the conference, you can still access these recordings online and you can also access the visuals that they have uploaded to illustrate their talks. So there's going to be lots more time for interaction and reflection. Now for all of you who are in the audience, we would love you to participate in one of three ways. You can first of all, just sit back, relax, enjoy, and, and be inspired by these wonderful talks. Then secondly, we would love you to use the Q&A function to, to put your questions there, also to upvote questions from others. And lastly, I'll be running a quick poll towards the end where you can vote for your favorite talk. Please make a note of the name of the speaker because you're going to need his or her name in order to vote for that specific talk. The best talk from each of these visual sessions will be repeated later during the conference itself. Now, my job as chair is to introduce the speakers. The hard part about it is that I also have to make sure that we keep on time so that we have time at the end for discussion. Our first speaker today is Oscar Cardenas from Mexico. He's going to tell us more about connecting science to people, specifically the role of national research and education networks in science communication, and I'm sure that it is based in his home country, Mexico. Thank you very much, uh, Oscar. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, Marina. And I'm going to share my screen so I can show the, the slides. And as you said, the title, um, I'm, I'm going to speak about this uh, National Research and Education and Networks. Uh, but what are these networks? Um, national Research and Education Networks are distinct from the public uh, or commercial of the internet. They coexist in a parallel space, which is reserved solely for the education and research communities. They are also called advanced networks. And in the world, there are more than 140 networks. They are all grouped in uh, big networks uh, in every continent, basically. Uh, these networks allow free transit of data and information because they are built on a spirit of collaboration. They are also the global infrastructure uh, sorry, well, uh, for the development of science, allowing researchers from any country to collaborate with their peers. Red Clara, which is a Latin American cooperation of advanced networks, is made up of 13 national networks. It develops and operates the only advanced internet network in Latin America. And it also provides regional interconnection and connection to the world through its international links to GIANT, which is a, a pan-European a pan, uh, advanced network, Internet2 from the United States, and also to them to the advanced networks of Africa, Asia, and Australia. In the Academic Network Summit of the Americas in 2019, a group of scientists and educators met to agree on a common agenda to address urgent issues and unite energies and thus increase cooperation and create opportunities to support science, technology, and innovation. The group agreed to cooperate in the research of one of the UN proposals towards 2030, which is considered a priority for the survival of, uh, survival of humanity, which is climate change. So these are some of the participants from eight countries, and we developed an agenda of collaboration in which uh, the, the, the collaboration included not only uh, uh, speaking uh, 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 between us, but also to create a series of webinars related to climate change and its impacts on different uh, issues. For example, global health, um, how to create these um, uh, open data uh, repositories, uh, how climate change impacts uh, hy hydrology, and also how some of the rural communities are adapting to climate change. Uh, our goals for the next uh, two or three years are to create a climate change scenario tool to know, view, and download the most updated projections for the future climate of Latin America based on regional and global projections. 
Also, uh, we want to make this platform available to the inhabitants of the regions most vulnerable to climate change in Latin America in such a way that they can know the possible scenarios in the face of this phenomenon and act accordingly. This is part of our uh, science uh, directed to people. And also, uh, we want to continue with the series of webinars related to climate change. And uh, with that, I finish and thank you very much for this really short <laughs> time for presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much um, very much, uh, Oscar. That was, was interesting and thank you for keeping to the time. Um, I appreciate how hard it must be in such a short space of time. So next we're going to go to Diogo de Oliveira from Brazil. Uh, he's going to touch on a topic that we don't talk about enough, I think, in science communication, and that is activism. And his talk also touches on the role of NGOs. So we're looking forward to listening to you, Diogo. Uh, thank you so much, Marina. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Diogo Lopez de Oliveira. I'm a professor in the Department of Communication at uh, Federal University of Campina Grande in Paraíba, northeastern Brazil. Uh, in the last uh, uh, meeting in 2018, the PCST conference in Dunedin, in New Zealand, uh, Professor Bruce Lewenstein noticed that there was a lack of NGOs participation in the science communication debate. Uh, and I suggested a research project for us to study the use of science communication by, made by NGOs. Uh, so this presentation follows on Bruce's lightning video. Uh, so since uh, 2019, uh, we study the relationship uh, of science uh, communication with environmental activism and, and social movements in Latin America. Um, why environmental NGOs? Because activists and journalists uh, use science communication as a tool for telling stories uh, about environmental conflicts that frequently turn violent. And why Latin America? Because this region is the most dangerous for activists and journalists in the whole world. Uh, so according to Global Witness reports, almost uh, 1,600 1, uh, land and environmental activists, uh, uh, activists, mainly peasants, indigenous people, uh, and members of traditional communities in conflictual areas uh, lost their lives between 2002 uh, and 2018, almost three times that of other regions in the world. So our main goal is to understand the use of science, of scientific storytelling by NGOs and activists uh, to defend their points of view uh, and to influence uh, public opinion towards uh, their position. Uh, our data is drawn from the formal um, reports of four NGOs and from uh, semi-structured interviews about the use of science communication. So science communication is a tool uh, uh, Latin American NGOs use to approach complex phenomena such as social environmental conflicts, but it's not the only one and not strong enough to reduce the alarming amount of violence in the region. So by, by, closer, uh, by coming closer to traditional communities, uh, understanding the importance of uh, preserving natural areas uh, and human knowledge, and also how academic can play a role in supporting local communities uh, and the environment. Uh, and by analyzing how NGOs and local communities use science and, and communicate science, and how the media, the state at different levels, industries and universities are involved in the conflicts, uh, we want to contribute to change in any sense this cruel reality. Uh, we also want to bring NGOs into the science communication debate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Diego. That was that was great. I will remind you that he's also uploaded a video recording by his collaborator, Professor Bruce Lowenstein, on the conference portal that you can um, access at any time. I think activists, the combination of NGOs, activism, storytelling, that's something that, that I would actually love to follow up with you about as well. So, so I absolutely love the title of the next talk. It is uh, Soap Bubbles and Vanitas, Mathematicians at the Time of the Virus. I really look forward to listening to you, Michele Emmer from Italy. Okay, Michele, just make sure that your, your mic is uh, on, please. Going to my presentation. 
the, do you have it now? Can you, this is the copy that you have? We can see you, Michele. We cannot see your presentation yet, but you can no, just start the screen share. Share the, the image, but it's not making the share. I don't know why. Um, uh, you don't have the copy of the, my presentation that I send you? I... Because there is still the PSC, CST title on the screen. Okay, what I'm going to do is, uh, because I just have a PDF and it may be hard to share, but I think what I can do is I can go to, you want to try again? Because we did do the screen share just now and it worked. Do you want to try again? Oh, it's not, it's not working. I don't know why. It is always, uh, I see always P, this uh, title PCST. Okay, in that case, I'm going to go to the next speaker and then I will get a uh, pull up a copy of your presentation and we'll come back to you next. Okay, okay. so our next speaker in that case is going to be uh, Clementina Equia from Mexico. Clementina, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Clementina Equiwa from uh, Institute of Ecology at uh, the National University of Mexico. And uh, when I submitted this, uh, this paper, uh, let me see, I cannot uh, move things. Okay, there you are. When I uh, submitted this uh, uh, abstract for this uh, presentation, uh, there was no COVID pandemics on, and the decade of biodiversity was not about to end. But the year go by, and uh, the, the situation with COVID improved, uh, vaccines start to, to move around by the end of the year. Uh, we had uh, vaccines moving around, but also at the end of the year, also, uh, we have the UN Convention on Biological Diversity publish its fifth global environmental outlook. Uh, I'm going to go in detail about this publication that it's very important in terms, in terms of biodiversity, but I only want to say that it is mentioned there that the Aichi target number one that is related with uh, communication of environmental issues to the public was not achieved. The Aichi biodiversity target is a strategic plan for biodiversity that include 20 measurable targets that were to be met by year 2020. Um, so I decided uh, to uh, see uh, use the uh, uh, comparison of uh, Twitter accounts uh, as a measure of outlet to see how much people is uh, interested or getting information from uh, sources that are related to the UN. Uh, the equivalent to the IPCC is the uh, IBES, the Intergovernment Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And here you can notice that uh, Indeed, uh, people is more interested or it's looking for more information related to climate change than to the biological diversity, which is something that it needs to be taken into account since we depend on biodiversity for our own survival. Uh, so I have been working uh, with uh, students I teach at the University of Mexico Science Communication and frequently uh, the students come asking for information mainly on species extinctions or things like that, uh, something very common and they ignore what is uh, uh, say or what the scientists are discussing and the, the amount of publications, it's a huge amount of publications and they ask always for the same kind of people or the same kind of subject. So I uh, have been thinking with uh, my students, with other colleagues, uh, the, the people who I teach with, with my husband and, and friends, uh, how to uh, 
improve these uh, communications, how to help add more information on environmental issues into, into the uh, news outlets or uh, any, uh, even for publishing uh, uh, stories uh, for kids, uh, books, etc. So I um, have been thinking uh, how they, the students can uh, approach Papers. We I need have, to, uh, yes. to wrap up almost, thank you. Okay. Please, you can, uh, you can wrap up. Okay, yes. Uh, so I just invite you to see uh, my paper that's there. I'm trying to make this uh, methodology and I would be very grateful if you could look at that uh, there carefully and we could talk and improve this methodology. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, you can just uh, stop sharing. And um, I, I really appreciate any efforts to build those bridges, you know, between science communication and, and research and actually, um, you know, going back to the papers itself. So I find it really fascinating. I see that Michelle is, Michele rather, is not um, in his uh, chair right now. So I think um, in that case, um, Carlo, we're going to carry on with you. Carlo Gubitosa is from Belgium. Uh, based in Belgium at least at the moment. Um, and he's going to touch on the topic of trust in science communication, which is of course a, a key issue at the moment. So over to you, um, Carlo. Uh, just make sure that we can hear you, Carlo, please. You can just start again. Here I am. Thanks to everyone. Yes, and thanks for uh, this opportunity to share with you this research that I did uh, on the topic of trust uh, in science communication. Uh, we used uh, uh, a powerful method named Delphi to extract a meaningful list from a group of experts that were based in two countries uh, and included uh, academic researchers, journalists, uh, and psychom practitioners. And uh, the lists that we asked to these experts were negative factors, positive factors, critical topics, and good practices affecting uh, the bond of trust between lay audiences uh, and science communication. Uh, the experts found a consensus on concerned domains and good practices, a strong consensus before and after the uh, spread of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, some topics went uh, out of focus. Uh, there was consensus only before, like uh, GMOs uh, and uh, biotechnologies. And some other topics, some good practices went into focus. So direct encounters with science communicators and science festival be, uh, found a consensus only after COVID-19 pandemics, meaning that there is an emerging need of science uh, communicated through real people in real places in a more uh, direct way. Uh, but uh, besides these lists uh, that uh, were uh, more than half of the pool of experts expressed the uh, uh, agreement before and after the pandemic, the tool that we can use uh, as uh, in our uh, activities are the uncertainties because uh, we have still uh, two lists uh, that uh, didn't find the majority of experts agreeing on, on these topics, but this is where we can start from uh, to make some audience analysis, public segmentation, strategic communication and content framing and other activities that are explained in my poster in the form of a comic uh, to understand uh, which of these positive factors, which of these opportunities, and which of these potential risks and threats uh, apply to our environment, to our local context, uh, to our cultural context, uh, and to the audience uh, that we are talking to when we do our specific uh, activities uh, of, uh, of science communication. So uh, from these uncertainties, we can uh, uh, adopt uh, an adaptive approach to understand what we do and how can, be, how can we become trustful and trustworthy. Thank you and see you uh, in the poster. Thank you very, very much, uh, Carlo. That was wonderful. I absolutely love your illustrations, as I mentioned to you before. It's uh, beautiful graphics using comics. It's, it's also something that I'm 
really interested in as a tool in itself, but you've, if you used it really well to illustrate um, your talk. At this stage, I should maybe take a quick minute just to remind the audience that we would like you to, to keep in mind your favorite talk, make a note of the talks that you really enjoy so that you can vote. You need to vote for the name of the presenter. And secondly, um, you are, you're welcome to use the Q&A function on this webinar to post questions or to upvote questions from other um, audience members. So um, we will go back to Michele uh, soon, as soon as he's available, but for, for now, our next speaker um, online then is going to be, I'm going to go to Aleta Mainsma. She is from the Netherlands. Um, she's presenting today on behalf of her colleague, Julia Kramer, but they both work together um, on this very fascinating topic and I'm not going to try and um, preempt it. It's got a fascinating title. I'm going to leave it to you, uh, Aleta, to tell us more about this. Yes, thank you. Okay, hi all. Uh, my name is Aleta Meinsma and I'm a PhD researcher in the group of Julia Kramer, which is based in Leiden in the Netherlands. And for the next three minutes, I'd like to ask you to join me um, to uh, dive into the world of the very small. Um, and in this world, uh, uh, counterintuitive science plays a role, which is called quantum science. And researchers are actually building new types of technology based on quantum science, uh, called quantum technology. And this will likely impact our society at large. So our question is, how can we organize evidence-based science communication for a dialogue on quantum science and technology? So when we dive into this world of the very small, um, we see that the particles over there, the atoms and the electrons, they behave differently from what we experience in our everyday lives. A particle, for example, can be in a superposition state, meaning that a particle can be in two places at the very same time. And also two particles can share an extremely strong connection with one another called entanglement, and this cannot be explained using classical physics. So researchers are taking these quantum mechanical properties and are building new types of technology. For example, a new type of internet and a new type of computer. And these could benefit our society at large. For example, quantum internet would allow for fundamentally secure communication, um, which could, uh, be, crit which could uh, be very useful for our cybersecurity challenges in the future. But like any technology, it also poses risks. For example, a quantum computer could potentially break our encryption methods and therefore our online communication is not secure anymore. So these technologies, they're societally disruptive. So how can we organize a societal dialogue about these uh, quantum, quantum science and quantum technology and involve different societal actors? Because currently there are actually a few issues with the current quantum narrative and jargon and these could hinder societal actors to join in on a dialogue. For example, the physics is often ex explained as being spooky and enigmatic. And in national strategies, a dominant uh, narrow public good frame was found, one about winning the quantum race. And another paper stated that the underlying physics is often not explained. And therefore people don't really get a feeling of why quantum technologies are different from classical technologies. There are also issues with certain words, for example, the word quantum supremacy, which is closely yeah, is associated with white supremacy and therefore closely linked to racism. So to wrap up, our question is, how can we involve different audiences to think and talk about quantum as a new disruptive technology? Would we need a new narrative and what would the effect of such a narrative be? Well, that's something that our research will look into in the next couple of years. Um, and if you have any ideas or thoughts, uh, and if you'd like to share them, uh, we'd love to hear them. So please then get in touch. Our email addresses are there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I certainly um, have to thank all my speakers for staying on time um, so well during this session. So, um, Michele, we are going to... Uh, so to you now, if you're ready, uh, or would you prefer us to take one more speaker before we get to you? No, I hope it is working now. Okay, let's try. Yeah. I think it's it's working. Yes, perfect. It's perfect. You can you can go ahead. So. Okay. 
Uh, I am primarily a mathematician. Uh, I will we'll talk a little bit about soap bubbles and vanitas and venice. The problem is to communicate mathematics, contemporary mathematics is very difficult. Not to be trivial, but just to say something interesting. So the subject is soap bubbles because soap bubbles is contemporary mathematics, but also game for children. But it's also is interest to architect, engineers, and surely artists. And it's connected also with the COVID because there is a ebook in free download by Springer. This is mathematics in the time of coronavirus. The idea was to give an idea, not only for mathematicians, but to a large audience, what can be of interest also for a large audience. And this book is now in free download. So I will give you an example of the subject. This is the first appearance uh, officially, I must say, of a soap bubbles in art. We are in the 16th century, it is Goltius. And uh, this is Dujardin, and uh, this is the was Holland here, we are in Denmark. This is Rembrandt. Uh, this is Newton looking to a boy playing ball bubbles. Newton is the first one who noticed the color of the soap film. This is Chardin, very famous, and then the other are even more famous, Manet. We are now in the 19th century. And this is also the period in which the theory of minimal surfaces, that is uh, the mathematical name for this subject in the calculus of variation appear. Uh, this is a very important result in uh, mathematics. Uh, they all, you, if you make millions, uh, millions of uh, soap films and bubbles connect together, they make only two kinds of angles. This one and that one. 120 degrees, 108 degrees, not more. And these are pictures by Bradley Miller, who is an artist whose uh, work is basically on uh, making pictures of soap film and soap bubbles. This is another model on the, on the left. And on the right, you have a sculpture by Nam Gabo in the 60s, inspired by the model. And also an inspiration for Fray Otto, famous German architect, made this, in the 60s the, these models with some film and invented what is called the architectural tensile structure. Most famous is the one, the tent of the Munich Stadium in Germany for the Olympic Games. And another swimming pool was made for the Olympic Games, this one in Beijing, 2008. And all the, the surface outside of the swimming pool and the inside is based on a problem of Lord Kelvin with minimal surfaces, so film and so bubbles and respecting exactly the rules of, uh, of the angles. Uh, but there's a very, very important um, contemporary mathematics. So on the left is Alessio Figalli, second Italian who received the Phil medals in 2018, for also for his search on uh, math model. On the left, you have uh, Karen Lurenberg, who is a very famous mathematician, the first woman who received in 2019 the Abel Prize. Why? For his work also on minimal surfaces. In contemporary of the opening of the exhibition in a very beautiful palace uh, of the Renaissance in Perugia. And this is the two pages that uh, the, the New York Times dedicated to the Abel Prize uh, to this uh, famous mathematician. Now I will show you the exhibition, just a few, well, I will give you the address on YouTube where you can see the exhibition. The uh, work of art coming from all over the world is uh, the pipe of, of Merrey. On the left is the poster based on the image of Dujardin. And this is sort of panorama or part. And this on the left was a section of mathematics on the optics of Newton, Darcy Thompson, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to look at the exhibition, this is the YouTube address, but you can just write Bolle di Sapone, you would see it. And uh, this is the, uh, why Venice? Because my conference on mathematics and culture take place in Venice. Why the COVID? Because you see there is nobody, absolutely nobody, only the police. On the right side, okay. is the, uh, yeah, Thank this is the end.
I think you are you are near the end. Thank you so much. That it is, I so, I'm so sorry to have to stop you. It's a, it's such an amazing uh, topic. Um, fascinating. Oh, visuals. Was, uh, uh, was we really, I really, really enjoyed that. If you could maybe just stop the screen sharing again. Ah, see, see. Um, then we will. Um, then we, we can carry on with our next speaker. Could you maybe get some help if this if the stop stopping the screen sharing? Uh, while we are waiting, I will ask uh, our next speaker to get ready. Um, so, and I've, I've got good news, and I have heard in, in the meantime that Ivan Eva Lukanda has joined us. But Ivan, oh, Ivan, I'm going to give you a little bit of time uh, to get settled. So, I think next we will go to Joanna Collett from Germany. Joanna is uh, uh, going to talk about global climate change uh, or global warming and climate change and local discourses. So, I'm really looking forward to your talk, uh, Joanna. Hi, thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. And then I can I start. Also not. Okay, oh. there we go. So, good evening, everyone. My name is Joanna Collert, as I already said, and I'm a master's student at the University of Hamburg in Germany. And today, I would like to talk to you about global warming in local discourses and why this is an important topic. So the global news that we receive daily about anthropogenic climate change is dominated by transnational political events such as the United Nations Climate Summits, authoritative scientific reports from the IPCC, or more recently by international protest movements such as Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion. And today it is my pleasure to introduce to you a book that I helped to put together as a student assistant, which examines how different communities around the world engage and make sense of climate change. So on the left hand side, you can see the cover of the book and it is open access and available from open book publishers. I have provided the link at the bottom as well. And the book introduces climate change as a traveling idea, which means that the global phenomenon is interpreted by communities according to their local realities. For example, their direct experiences of extreme weather events, pre-existing values and belief systems. And the book uses five international case studies to illustrate the local discourses around climate change in different communities. One example that I would like to illustrate is a case study which examines the climate change discourse in the Maasai tribe in northern Tanzania and is based on a 14 month ethnographic fieldwork by the chapter author Sarah Lewitt. In the Maasai tribe, the scientific narrative of anthropogenic climate change clashes with the religious beliefs of the tribe as the community believes that weather is controlled by God and extreme weather events are overcome by prayer. There, also, the Maasai people have stated having more pressing issues to deal with than climate change, for example, land alienation. In this case, the global climate narratives do not resonate with local concerns. On my summary slide, you can see on the left hand, the poster that would have been presented at the live talk, um, so you can at least get a brief look at it. And I would like to conclude my talk by saying that um, local circumstances, for example, religious beliefs, as was the case in the Maasai tribe, influence whether a traveling idea is embraced or rejected. And by identifying links between the global problem and local concerns, useful strategies for engaging people with climate change can be developed. For example, going back to the case of Tanzania, Land alienation is likely intensified by the decreasing availability of fertile land, which is impacted by climate change. And by highlighting this causality change, the local discourse may be linked to the global phenomenon, resulting in an improved resonance within the local community. In conclusion, local discourses and interpretations reveal very crucial insights about local priorities and values, and should not be treated as barriers in the global pursuit for climate change adaptation, but instead should be integrated into an effective climate communication. That's the end of my talk. Thanks a lot for listening and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very, very much, um, Joanna. That's certainly, um, you know, we all know one of the hot topics um, I, I, in, in science communication and um, I'm sure there will be some questions and discussions around that topic as well. So now oh, we're staying in Germany for our second to last speaker, Alexandra Schultz. Um, and Alexandra has asked me to share her presentation on her behalf. So I'm going to try and do that. And then Alexandra, you can um, just uh, tell me, um, you know, if 
if I you know, need to, I'm going to just um, just start this. Uh, so let's do this. And let's see if I can make it full screen. Okay. Okay, and thanks a lot. Right, okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing and the inconvenience, but yeah, it's due that I'm working in a further agency and we have kind of security reasons and travel stuff. So, um, okay, I'm working as a scientific officer at the German Environment Agency, and I would like to show you um, some of the ideas we have for our public and scientific communication as a federal agency, because it's quite different to like other institutions. So can you please go to the next slide? Because as a um, federal agency, we are obliged by law to inform about the state of the environment in Germany. And unfortunately, most of these mandatory reports are um, only fulfill their legal duty to inform, but they are not suitable for the public at all. It means they are just very boring. So, but with our work, we try to change this a little bit. And to meet the requirements, of this law and at the same time become better in public communication. Uh, we tried several approaches for different communication or at least for different access to our content, to our information. So in, in doing this, we have to face a lot of challenges that are listed here, but I don't go into detail. So next slide, please. So this is the website of, of our agency and my department um, is responsible for the data area. And to evaluate and to uh, perform or to become better with our content, we did a lot of uh, usability tests like eye trackings or interviews or online surveys. And uh, one of the results you can see on the next slide was that many users of our um, internet site, um, they want to have much more individualized um, information of us. So therefore one attempt of us was to create um, the possibility for users that they can create their own individual report, which is only filled with the content that is for interest of, uh, of the user. So, and next slide, please. Another result of these um, tests was that the users want to have more overviews of environmental topics because they are often really complex and they want to have like a short view of all the topics. And therefore we try to develop a so-called environmental monitor where you can see at a glance the state of the environment in Germany. So we try to give like this overview for them. Um, next slide, please. So also our amount of geodata we increased um, during the last years, we, we uh, have now interactive maps, we have map services, which showed us a huge increase in access numbers. And next slide, please. And this was also a result that the users wanted to have more levels of complexity. So therefore we created infographics that we use now as a like very easy access to our complex content. Um, and the next slide, please. And another issue was that we tried to offer a more playful access for like younger users, um, which or this tool should help the users to um, understand the relations between different environmental topics and the chain of cause and effect. And now they have a more playful access to our content, which they use quite a lot. Uh, next slide, please. And so the access numbers over the last years show a huge increase. So therefore we think we are on a good track by um, trying every time new ways of access to our information and getting more users to our uh, content. Uh, next slide, please. So, and just as a brief outlook uh, for our work for the next years is that we also try to work on serious gaming and sustainability, that we want to recreate the um, environmental report of the German government, which is one of these boring mandatory reports nobody wants to read, but it makes a lot of work. So. And we also want to try to provide large amount of data um, that can be analyzed independently and individually by the users. So this is our focus for the next years. Thanks for listening. Well, this was fast. <laughs> okay. Thank you very, very much, um, Alexandra. I appreciate that. Um, as I realized how hard it is to present something in such a short time, I was thinking this evening of but my journalism professor always used to say, tell us the story about, and I'm not sure who was the original um, 
person who said this, but it's a story that's often told that you that uh, somebody wrote a letter to his friend and said, I'm sorry that I'm writing you a long letter today. I don't have time to write a short letter. And it just reminds us how much harder it is to put something in, you know, in a short space of time or, or just in a short uh, few words rather than having the luxury of, of elaborating as long as we want. So I really appreciate all of your efforts to do that. So last speaker for the night and definitely, or for this session at least, definitely not least, it's Ivan Lukanda. Uh, also from um, a fellow um, African, he's from Uganda. And Ivan, I, uh, I'm very glad that you were able to join us. And I'm just trying to see if you are here because it's now your turn to speak. Ivan, if you are, are on the call, can you just let me know? I thought I had a message that he actually did manage to join. Oh, there, here, there he is. Um, Ivan, is, is the, are you there? Ivan, I, I, I think I see you, but I don't hear you, but it, it doesn't seem as if you're muted, but just want to give you another opportunity to try and get your presentation going. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem as if it's working and there's always uh, the risk with these online meetings that somebody may not be able to speak. Uh, Ivan, can you hear us? Can you maybe just indicate, I can see you on the video. Um, okay. Can you start to talk? Unfortunately, I think I'm afraid that it doesn't seem as if this is going to work. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, Ivan, I would encourage people to go and look at your at the visuals that you've uploaded to the conference platform. Ivan's topic was science versus alternative facts, rolling the GMO debate. That is, of course, a, a hot topic um, uh, also in many countries, including in many African countries. Um, I'm going to ask you now, first of all, to think about your favorite talk um, of this session. Here is the poll. I'm going to launch the poll and I'm going to ask you to, to just choose one. You just click on the one person that you enjoyed most listening to. Um, and I'm going to give you a, a few minutes to do that. I don't mm -hmm. think the presenters themselves are able to vote. So, so it will only be for the um, attendees, the other delegates. Just going to allow another 30 seconds or so for the voting. I cannot vote. It's it's only open, I think, to the delegates, not to the presenters. That would be why. Okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I need there's about four more people who should be voting, but I think that's going to end soon. So the next uh, item on our agenda when the voting is done is that we will look, think of questions. I, we have uh, 15 minutes left for that. Um, and I will also uh, give the opportunity to, to, to present us to ask questions of each other. I think this has been a fascinating session, very diverse topics, but still, if I think back, you know, from soap bubbles to, um, you know, so, so many like, I'm just looking at these amazing topics, um, quantum empowerment, quantum science, um, global warming, um, you know, the role of different organizations and networks. I think we've had a really fascinating um, session. And I know it takes a lot of uh, preparation. So I would like to thank um, all the presenters for the effort that they've invested. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to close the poll now. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, right. So later in the course of the, of the conference, we will announce the winning talk from each of these sessions and the winner, winners, so to say, will then be invited to repeat their talks um, later um, during a special session. 
So um, if, if at any stage, uh, if, even you're able to, uh, to meet online, um, I would um, welcome you to do your talk since we do still have time. But for now, I'm going to open um, the first question. Um, okay, so I think uh, this, some of them have been answered. Some of you have actually uh, provided answers already. Um, let's go to the first open question. Um, okay, yeah, this is a tricky one, but it's to Aleta Mainsma. While talking about quantum technologies is too much linked to computers and phone industry. I love how the Marvel movie Ant-Man and the Wasp explored the quantum realm. But in your research, have you encountered articles that explore how sci-fi movies may influence public opinion about quantum tech subjects? That's, that's a really fascinating question. I can repeat it if necessary, or are you happy to answer Aleta? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question too. And actually we haven't considered considered this yet. So this would be a really good research. Um, so thanks for the idea. Yeah, that, that link between popular culture and, and what we do in science communication is, is always uh, fascinating to, to explore. Um, I don't know, it says that you've answered the question live, but I'm going to put it to you anyway, just in case you, know, you want to maybe elaborate and others can also listen to your reply. Um, you say it's the person, um, Anne, Anne Grant asked, you talk to researchers, journalists, and psychom practitioners, but do you have any evidence on what non-experts think about the practices that supports how much or how little they trust sources? So in other words, what do the, the public, you know, the lay audiences, what do they think about trusting different sources? Yes, what I showed is one side uh, of the coin and the other one uh, would be uh, some uh, work workshops that I'm organizing with high school students. So the idea is to, pro to, to see if the production of uh, uh, scientific contents uh, in uh, multi-stakeholder groups formed by uh, students, uh, journalists uh, and researchers or psychom practitioners can uh, promote, can foster uh, trust in science, in science communication. And there we will ask uh, the students uh, to uh, produce content and explain their choices for sources. So why did they choose um, the sources that they use for producing such content? Why they consider them trustworthy and which sources they discarded uh, and why? So this is uh, actually the, um, the first block of uh, a more uh, uh, elaborate work, but we needed to put uh, our ground uh, as a trust in science communication. Uh, it's uh, a, a concept not, not deeply explored. We felt the need uh, to put uh, a solid ground uh, in uh, one qualitative analysis uh, from uh, a panel of uh, experts. Okay, thank you very, very much for that explanation. Um, I'm going to uh, try and rephrase a little bit a question from Karin Conway. She's a colleague of mine. I see that Aleta answered it already, but I want to come back to this question. And it's about preempting, um, anticipating the questions that a public may have about any topic that we um, communicate. And I would invite anybody on the panel who would like to respond. So the question, the way I would maybe rephrase it, it because already there's been one answer to, to this question, but you know, how can we, when we are excited about a topic uh, and we want to engage the public and we want to communicate about it, do we spend enough time on anticipating and trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the public and thinking about what their concerns may be, what they want to know, what would be interesting to them. Is that something you do? And how do you do that? Maybe if anybody um, on the panel who would like to maybe respond to that anticipation and preempting of public views and concerns. Anyone on the panel, is, is that a, something that is that you built into your science communication practice or even your research? Yes, Clementina, please go ahead, just uh, unmute. 
Uh, well, it's it's very difficult. Despite you you try hard to to be on the foot of of your public, uh, but um, I think uh, well, I recently was writing a book for kids, and it's really hard to be on the foot of kids of five year olds. So uh, for me, uh, it's a little bit to think of what is beautiful of, about what you are uh, looking at, or if it's a phenomena, or if it's a scientific methodology, uh, try to grab that, uh, that, that part of the beauty, the, the experience of, of think if, thinking on how you can make a, an experiment be successful, for instance, that's that has some beauty in itself. So try to grab that uh, to to try to uh, I don't know if the word in English is uh, contagiate the the people to 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 feel what you are feeling about this this particular subject. But I mean, it's it's hard if if you are moving a, a, a public a public uh, that goes from five year olds to people 90 year old uh, mm -hmm. but at least try to to look for that from the point of view of, of your public thank you very very much Clementina. i i agree with that very much um, i was thinking um alexandra thank you i'm coming to you next um i was also thinking about you know the diversity of audiences when i was listening to the talk by michele about the soap bubbles it is something that we all you know did as when we were children, and it's something that 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 still fascinates me when I see young children blowing soap bubbles. And I think secretly sometimes we all still enjoy doing it. But you know, then when you get to the physics and and the chemistry and of, of what's happening there, it becomes complicated very quickly. So you know, how do you um, anticipate what the different audiences may want to know? That's very interesting. Alexandra, please over to you. Well, thanks. So we do a lot of research about our target groups because the, the law says that we should inform the interested public, but this means like from the five year old to the grandma. And then we try to identify the different target groups by doing personas or doing a lot of workshops. And at the end, we had to realize that often the theory like about the personas didn't really fit with our product. So the products we we have and then uh, had on our website were often used by completely different people than we expected before. So we are really struggling in, in making products that fit to uh, special target groups. So we only often try in our work that our products are uh, understandable for the majority that we try to have like these different levels of complexity that we have like really easy products like the number of the month which is just a little uh, highlight on a topic and then we have the possibility where you can have all the raw data for like mean air quality for all the experts so we really try to separate our our products in this different way um, levels of complexity and this is the way that helps us um, the best to reach uh, a lot of people. Yeah, thank you very very much. It's um it's sometimes very hard I think for um us to accept, but I I know that it's often said one of the first rules of effective public engagement or effective public communication is to know your audience, and knowing your audience sometimes requires research, as you said, especially if you're embarking on a big ambitious you know multi year project. It does make sense to invest that time and effort upfront to really understand who you're engaging with. Um, you may have heard as well that people say, you know, if you're trying to reach everybody, you're probably reaching nobody really effectively. Um, and it's sometimes not something that is popular, you know, with scientists. If you tell them that, that they need to really invest, very often we think we know our audiences. And even still today, we often see these uh, communication strategies that tries to reach the general public as if you know there's one sort of um, mass of people out there that share the same interests and characteristics that we can engage with. So I would welcome any further thoughts on this idea of really knowing who you engage with, how to do it more effectively, 
or any other questions indeed before we wrap up um we do have about five minutes left anybody any one of the panelists also welcome to ask a question to anybody one of your fellow presenters maybe I will have too many questions to all of them because I was fascinated by all the presentations. So I will uh, take my question for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will get in touch uh, afterwards now that we know yeah. each other. I certainly also would love to follow up with, with some of you and explore some opportunities. Unfortunately, we have fortunately we have a month or more ahead of us of PCSP engagements. This is a very new way of doing the PCSD conference, um, but it's spread out over a longer period of time. So that gives us the luxury of being able to engage um, and being able to follow up. And, and I certainly know that I'm going to spend a lot of time looking at the recordings, because obviously, depending on where you are in the world, some of these sessions take place in the middle of the night. And so fortunately, we'll be able to catch up as uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, According to the conference organizers, I understand that all the recordings will be online for up to a month after the conference finishes. So I think if there are no further questions, I don't see any other questions from um, the audience either. Uh, it is then my job to, to wrap this up, to thank all of you for your presentations and to wish you um, a, an enjoyable online PCSD conference over the next month ahead. And thank you very much um, to everybody who has uh, participated also in the chat. Um, it is really nice. To, it, it, we get that feeling, at least we are talking, we are um, engaging, we are having a conversation about science communication, which is a topic close to all our hearts. And um, it's so, so exciting to see young people, new researchers emerging, exp highly experienced researchers sharing their expertise. Um, and I, I look forward to, to PCST. Um, events over the next month very much, and I hope to see many of you there. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank thanks, you. Martina. Bye. Thanks, thanks, everyone. So Bye. Bye.